it seems to me as an outsider that there's a general debate that's been going on for about 30 years between text and context. And I really think it is as simple as that. Uh, some people doing psychological studies on interpreting, conference interpreting especially, are focused on the text as the measure of success. You're a successful interpreter when you get everything that's in the incoming text. And you're often trained according to that model. Opposed to that, we have an increasing number of researchers who say, well, yes, but success also depends on all these other things. Who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, about what and what have what effect. Underlying that debate between text and context, you have a classical debate within translation studies between prescriptive approaches and descriptive approaches. The strange thing is, looking at the text, especially Daniel Gilles' text that we looked at from his major book, even when people are being descriptive, and, and, and Gilles would be a descriptivist, he wants to describe what people do, the very questions that are being asked and the very measuring sticks that are being used impose a certain prescriptivism. Now, when I look at the text and the research as an outsider, it really seems to me that that debate hasn't moved for 10 years or so. It's sort of an underlying tension within the research community, which overlaps very heavily with the conference interpreting community. And people sort of stay there. It's sort of implicit. I, 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 my proposition was to look at interpreting and translation in one view and to problematize it by using the categories of the written versus the spoken or the oral. Orality, oral, spoken communication versus written communication. And see how those very, two very powerful categories underlie everything we're doing here. The categories are incredibly important because so much academic, tertiary, educational work is written. You are evaluated so heavily on what is written. Mind you, you're evaluated on how you speak and interpreting performances. You're an exceptional group within that uh, general overview. But educational institutions in the Western tradition have been concomitant, concomitant and developed at the same time, at the same pace, as the use of writing written, educated, formal uh, communication. But spoken language has been with us for about two million years, and written language has been with us for a maximum of 5,400 years. This means that for most of what we are, as a pre-programmed human brain prepared to communicate, most of that tradition and building up has been with spoken communication. Written communication is a relatively new invention. And yet we speak as if it were the only kind of communication that's valid or worth training people in. It's sort of assumed when you get to school you know how to talk, you go to school to learn to write. We somehow never stop teaching you how to write. Except for you people, you're in a very privileged, exceptional location within the education system. Michael Cronin, in his paper, um, points out that translation studies has totally ignored the two million year perspective. We can't say much about what was spoken prior to the invention of writing, because the invention of writing was also the invention of history that we could communicate experience over distances, and therefore the ephemeral nature of everything that was done prior to that with the way human communities uh, dealt within their structure and between uh, the different uh, communities, between the different languages, all that has been lost because of the ephemeral nature of oral communication. But even within what Michael Cronin then calls secondary orality, 
primior, primary orality is communities that are non-literate. Some of them still exist, okay, but not many. But we were all there for most of humanity. And secondary orality is the orality that is remaining, that remains within written cultures. We're in a literate culture, and yet we have this secondary orality there. And this gives us the problematic of how that secondary orality relates to the written word. Most of translation studies is on written communication. The one little bit that has focused on secondary orality is the work done on conference interpreting. Mainly conference interpreting. It would seem then to be somehow resisting the onslaught of the power of the written. You are the retainers of too many years of tradition. Well, no, let's not go too far down that track. Croner goes on to say, well, yes, but look what happens. All the research is on conference interpreting. And so much of the actual interpreting that's happened for two million years, so much of the relations between migrant groups, contact groups, people who have to sort out problems in oral culture, all that is lost. Nobody's looking at it. Nobody wants to study it. Conference interpreting is a thing, and the rest of oral communication, including a lot of actual, what do we call it, community, public service, escort, they're all these, but you know, the majority of the interpreting activities are not seen by us. Cronin uh, goes on, and I cite, Minority groups in developed countries, that is when they get to developed countries, we're basically talking about immigration here, refugees, immigrants, ethnic minorities, can themselves be victims of this theoretical exclusion as they often only merit conference status when it is not they who speak but others. That is social workers, government officials, academics, the police, others who speak for them. The, the problematics that are driving the need for conference interpreting, or for interpreting in general, only reach the, the purview of, of theorists and, and researchers when it gets into the conference setting, and there you have people speaking on behalf of the people who really need the services. I think there's a lot to be said for that. Mind you, Michael Cronin himself is speaking on behalf of these excluded people and engaged in the same sort of paradox. He goes on to say even that looking at the bit that's been done in conference interpreting studies, uh, a lot of it has been very empirical, especially from Dan Yuzhil, but people following that, to make this an empirical, and the psychological tradition that preceded Jill. Make this an empirical tradition. Kurt says, well, yes, okay, that's good because we discover things by measuring, by finding out, going out to find what's there. But look, he says, conference interpreting is the only setting when you can really control the input and the output and compare them. The very focus on empirical research itself underlies the focus on conference interpreting which by definition excludes the majority of, of interpreting encounters. Why? Well, when you get most of the interpreted encounters, go to hospitals, go to asylum hearings, go to the sort of thing we're going to see in the practical uh, exercise that follows this, you've got somebody speaking through a mediator and an immediate reply and immediate reply and then a checking on this, and it's not easy to get the input the output to compare the two. The, the process is far more dialogic, trialogic, with many different voices coming in, and the intermediary doing many different things. It's hard to do, harder to measure. Uh, so Cronin actually criticizes empirical studies as playing into the game of focusing on conference interpreting which he sees as the prime form of oral communication in the West, 
being imposed on the rest of the world. Interpreting activities will become academically legitimate when they enter the conference arena, so let's all strive to get our representative into the United Nations or similar bodies where they can speak. The rest we don't see. Part of the problem here is that when you get into the conference setting where you have well-dressed, civilized, well-spoken representatives, you have what Cronin goes on in citing from Wilden, from Anthony Wilden, you have a, what he's calling symmetrization. Symmetrization. I think I'm going to let you actually see this one. Whoops. There you go. Symmetrization <coughs> is making something appear symmetrical. That is not in itself symmetrical. What does symmetry mean? The same on both sides, right? The ideological and unreal flattening out of a hierarchical relationship. And citing here, you know, the boss's door is always open. Oh, that's great. I can always go and see the boss. We're on good terms. We're equals. Uh -huh. But the boss always remains the boss. And this putative equality is just a consoling fiction. Like the United Nations, where everybody is the same, everybody has a vote, everybody has a right to speak, but nobody is equal. Okay. Now, the conference interpreting situation is that. And the role of the interpreter there as a neutral intermediary, the absolute professional, is a functional and necessary part of that illusion of symmetry. It's assumed the interpreter is not on one side or the other. But if you go back and look at where you come from and who chose you and how you got there, or how interpreters are selected and chosen through history, you'll realize that this is very rarely a neutral, uh, value-free, merit Talk meritocratic operation. What you've got is Hernán Cortés, okay, Spanish conquistador, uh, making an agreement, you see, with uh, the leader of the Chalcalans, <laughs> of these guys, and they are making a pact to go and attack Moctezuma, who's the big boss of the Mexica, okay? So here he is. Uh, this is part of the, the basic technique of conquest, which is what happens in the world. And uh, you will see down here Doña Marina, the interpret, interpreter, interpreter for Cortés. Uh, remarkably, she is larger than the soldiers, more powerful, <laughs> larger than the horse, <laughs> more powerful than a horse. <laughs> Okay, uh, the same size as the actual leaders, you know, elevated uh, to the position of the actual negotiators as the major third party. Note, though, that the situation is not symmetrical. Whose side is she standing on? More on Cortés than on the head of the Tlaxcalans. <coughs> okay. Who has the most men? The Spaniards on that side or the other guys? <laughs> well, they're fairly well represented, but there are more men on the Spanish side, and the Spaniards have got this remarkable new technology called the horse, <laughs> which is absolutely essential for conquest. I mean, no, the, the, the horse is basic technology for conquest. If you've got that, you can do wonderful things. Okay, the interpreter is a major part of the interaction. But she is never neutral, and not represented as being neutral either. She is more on one side than the other. Um, the negotiation is carrying out, is being carried out, but it's not in a symmetrical situation. What interests me in this is... If Cronin, I think, overstates the case. I mean, he has his own illusion of symmetry, where you've got the, the wicked West against the whole of the rest, 
and the wicked west is aligned with the written and it's aligned with somehow marginalizing the spoken and then only picking up on conference interpreting which is the privileged form of the west and so it's all imperialism okay somehow it doesn't all fit in so neatly to me you know the goodies and the baddies which is what cultural theorists like to have the good guys and the bad guys um, I suggest that it's not quite as symmetrical as that. I'd like to question, though, whether or not in the kinds of situations that are around us where interpreters are employed, whether or not the written doesn't actually retain more power. Okay. Is it a case where the oral survives as a vestige of two million years or as representation of Western imperialism? can't be both at the same time, surely. However, or is it the case that the oral is sort of just there to provide the illusion of symmetry? Now consider the following. In the courts, and some of you have interpreted in courts, I know. In the courts, what is valid testimony? What is said or what is written? Transcripts. Thank you. Yes. That's what goes on the records. That's what's referred to. The written has its power in the courts. Why is the interpreter there? So we can produce the written. Strangely enough. Their positions. Their positions in it is an area where, where uh, Dr. Uh, Takeda has worked a lot, and started to write about. Um, there too, what counts are the transcripts, but uh, it gets to the point where the interpreter is getting, okay, you've got somebody being deposed, they're speaking English, it's coming through the transcript, the transcript comes on the scene for the interpreter into Japanese, who can interpret from the transcript, because it's the transcript that counts, or use the transcript to back up what is being heard. That the input is at once written and spoken. Our technologies have got to that point where spoken input is never pure or need not be pure in these cases where what is written prevails. It's safer for the interpreter to work from what's written because that's what counts. I think I told you the story as well, did I, of the interpreters of the famous Nuremberg trials, who, uh, you know, the, the great founding act of conference interpreting as a simultaneous, uh, simultaneous interpreting. Mind you, the subsequent trials didn't use uh, simultaneously, it went back to consec. However, the interpreters, if they made a mistake, would go up at night to the written records and change the transcript. <laughs> what counted for history, and that's what the trials were there for, was the written evidence, not the spoken performance. Scientific conferences. I don't know if you've been interpreting at scientific conferences. Um, as I said, my, my limited experiences in medical conferences. Not hard to do. Why? Well, all the papers are written beforehand. The papers are written beforehand. If I'm stuck, I get a hold of the paper and go through it. Not only that, the PowerPoints are prepared beforehand. Get the PowerPoint and go through that. A lot of the preparation you do for a conference is written language. And you write down your notes and compile your glossaries, the written on the written. When you get to the actual performance, the oral performance, well, it's all been done. I mean, the speaker's there, the papers are there, the PowerPoint's up there. You're just sort of this added ornament to written communication, surely. Ooh, that's going to upset some people. <laughs> but think about while you're there. In fact, why do they have the conference at all? Why do people have, if it's all written already, why don't you just say at home and exchange papers and PowerPoints? Because it's boring. Good, it's boring. You so you're really, that's, I'm going to get there, but you've, you've prompted me, you're really entertainers. <laughs> 